1948, the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This agreement, signed in the wake of the Second World War, was a landmark. For the first time in history, it formally established the rights and freedoms necessary to secure the dignity and worth of each individual. But a lot has changed since 1948. The rapid digitization of everyday life has transformed, and continues to transform, the way we communicate, express and organize ourselves, with significant implications for a range of different rights, including the rights to freedom of expression and information, the rights to association and assembly, and the right to privacy. These technologies have undoubtedly opened new opportunities to exercise human rights, like providing new ways for scrutiny of politicians, but they have also created new threats. By the end of this video, you should have a clear understanding of the way in which human rights are currently protected, how the digital age is affecting human rights, and where and how you can engage with the different actors involved. Human rights are the basic rights and freedoms that everyone should have. They apply regardless of where you are from, what you believe and how you choose to live your life and are based on the values of dignity, fairness, equality, respect and independence. But they are not just abstract concepts. They are defined and protected by a system of human rights codified through a range of treaties. The basis is the International Bill of Rights which consists of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Other regional treaties adopted by the Council of Europe, the Organization of American States and the African Union support this regime. Additional treaties deal with specific issues or groups like the Convention Against Torture, the Refugee Convention and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But the rise of the digital environment has complicated things. The norms and protocols of the Internet were, in large, developed independently of the state. Today, as a result, much of the Internet's infrastructure and services are owned by the private sector and its users operate across jurisdictions. Human rights laws and norms, on the other hand, were designed to be implemented by states. Acknowledging this tension in 2012, governments in the UN Human Rights Council agreed that the same human rights that exist offline apply online. In other words, the changes initiated by the digital age do not require new rights for people. Instead, existing rights should be respected and strengthened. This is an important step, but making sure it's put into practice can, as we'll see, be a challenge. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what does the Internet actually mean for human rights? Let's have a closer look at some of the opportunities it offers. It allows ordinary people to communicate globally with almost limitless potential reach. In the past, this was only possible for a select few. It provides new ways to connect and mobilise. Just think of all the protests now organised through Facebook. And when it's unrestricted, it gives access to an unprecedented amount of information. But what about the ways it can threaten human rights? As the Snowden revelation showed, new digital technologies have made state surveillance more comprehensive, invasive and easier to disguise. This gives states more control over their citizens. In some cases, the Internet can also enable censorship, often from unexpected quarters. Social media platforms, for example, now routinely censor content, and search engines use algorithms to determine what you get to see, all without any accountability or transparency. Then there's the collection and analysis of huge amounts of personal data, essentially the business model of the Internet. This can create significant issues for privacy and data protection, which we'll be focusing on later in the series. And, as human rights defenders who have suffered online harassment, abuse and threats will attest, the Internet can chill expression as well as enable it. But the Internet isn't just a list of positives and negatives which you can address one by one. It's a political construct informed by a set of dominant narratives. One current popular narrative presents the Internet as inherently threatening, whether as a den of criminals or a safe place for extremists. In this context, human rights are seen as incompatible with security. If we want a free, open and secure internet, we'll need to challenge narratives like this at their root. 
Digital technologies and the internet are governed by a complex array of different bodies, treaties and standards, which provide the basis for discussions around the respect and protection of human rights. They include technical bodies like the Internet Engineering Task Force, or ICANN, which determine codes and protocols, and the International Telecommunications Union, which sets standards for the internet's telecommunication infrastructure. Alongside this, there are specific trade treaties and agreements which affect the experience of users on the web, such as the World Intellectual Property Organization, which sets the rules on copyright. Then, there are normative standards produced by organizations like the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or the Council of Europe. On top of this, the UN has established a process to look at the implications of the digital age for society called the World Summit on the Information Society. This process, in turn, led to the establishment of the Internet Governance Forum, an annual global forum for discussing the entire range of Internet policy issues. Other UN mechanisms, like the Special Rapporteurs for Free Expression and Privacy, have also played an important role in standard setting for human rights in the digital age. Finally, there are ad hoc bodies, like the government-led Freedom Online Coalition and various civil society coalitions and networks actively promoting human rights online. It can be challenging enough to decide on the rules for policy and decision-making. Finding consensus and compromise on different cyber policy issues, many of which affect human rights, is even harder. It requires long-term commitment and dialogue across all these forums. Let's look at a few real-life examples of the digital age affecting human rights. First, let's look at Brazil. In 2014, Brazil passed its Internet Bill of Rights, the Marco Civil de Internet, into law. It was a unique success story, both in bringing legislation up to speed with the digital age and for the open, inclusive way it was developed. Only a year later, cracks began to appear, notably with the decision of a judge to ban WhatsApp in Brazil for 48 hours. Fast forward to 2016, the Brazilian Parliament has tabled an amendment to the Marco Civil, dubbed the CPI Cyber Proposal. The bill introduces a new interpretation of defamation, undermining the freedom of expression it is meant to guarantee and substantially weakening privacy and data protection, for example by requiring Internet service providers to reveal users' IP addresses without a court order. Only with the continued attention and commitment from human rights defenders will it be possible to maintain and build on successes like the Marco Civil. Another example is Iran. When the Internet was introduced in Iran, users saw it as an easy way to get around Iran's strict press laws. Today, two-thirds of the Iranian population are Internet users, and dissidents and activists rely heavily on digital communication with the outside world to share stories of state repression. In response, direct censorship and control of digital communications have been stepped up significantly by the regime. It's estimated that half of all popular websites are censored, and bloggers, online activists and technical staff can face jail terms, harassment and abuse. Iran is now developing an internal intranet which blocks email services, inhibits encryption and bans foreign security software. This is a clear instance where the exercise of human rights depends on access to the Internet and where denial of access directly contravenes human rights. As a human rights defender, there are many ways that you can protect and promote human rights in cyber policy at the grassroots level. You can, for example, encourage users to protect their privacy with tools like VPNs or anonymity networks. Individual behavioural changes like this can significantly affect the way services are developed. Think of ad blockers, for example. The increased use of these apps has affected the way publishers use advertising, in some cases by removing more invasive or annoying ads. Little changes like this can have a big impact. Demonstrations, petitions and campaigns can also have notable impact. Take the civil society response to the Snowden revelations, for example. Concerted advocacy by a coalition of different groups and movements has put privacy high on the policy agenda. There are also more formal ways to engage. The multi-stakeholder nature of cyber policymaking means that civil society can now access a range of regional and global policy forums, like the Global and Regional IGFs, 
on an equal basis with governments and businesses. The ITU sitting on government delegations. The UN Human Rights Council as observers but able to lobby governments. Or the OECD, where civil society representatives have a consultative status. There is still, of course, much work to be done to ensure cyber policymaking is open and inclusive. But there are undoubtedly opportunities. The internet is still, after all, a young technology with few established experts in the field. This means there's a lot still to be decided, and human rights defenders can play a crucial role in shaping its future by fighting for cyber policies which respect and strengthen human rights. In the next video, we'll be focusing on the impacts of the digital age on privacy and data protection. Music